No, that's easy. Okay. Uh, two minutes. Oh, it's way past two minutes. Yeah, so okay, okay. going? And is yeah. it on? It's on. The two minutes is up, apparently. Uh, my name's Claire Cranville, and I'm a member of the church, and I'm a member of the church council. And I uh, would like to welcome everyone who's come tonight from our local community and our community at large to uh, uh, share in enjoying the space of this room and share our discussion together this evening. Um, our pastor couldn't be here tonight. Her name's Donna Giver Johnston, and uh, I'm sure she would like to pass that message to you as well. And over to Thaddeus Popovich, who will be leading the message. So welcome, everybody. I'm glad you could come. Um, my name is Thaddeus Popovich. Some people know me as Ted. I'm moving forward with my given name, uh, like it or not. Um, a little bit about me. I'm. Uh, a co-founder of ACAN, Allegheny County Clean Air Now, so there are a bunch of us in the room. If you're a co-founder, that means there's more than one of us, <laughs> okay? Uh, I, somehow I assume the leadership mantle. Um, so, uh, some more about me. Uh, uh, I'm the grandson of immigrants from the Balkans, a grandmother who was totally illiterate in any language. Uh, my grandfather, my uh, maternal grandfather worked in uh, in the industry in Washington County. Uh, I lived in a plant, plant. He died from an industrial accident. I had two other uncles who worked in JNL uh, industries. They died terrible uh, deaths from chronic diseases, which, are, which more than likely were caused by working in the environments that they worked in, even though they made good money. I personally have been laid off from industry. I know what that feels like. In 2002, during a dot-com bubble burst, I was with Corning Optical Fiber. We were at the top of the heap in the world, and then suddenly we weren't. Uh, so half of my business was told to go, thank you very much. I was better than most. I got early retirement benefits, and I was able to survive and do other things. So I know what it's like to be laid off. I know what it's like to have people in my family suffer from working in heavy-duty industries. Um, so I have, I have empathy and sympathy for any of you who are workers in the room at the Shenango plant. Okay? Uh, let's, let's move along. Uh, the first slide, yeah, let's go back to that. So just to frame why we're here, uh, there were some, uh, I had some calls from media saying, well, um, we would like, uh, oh, who's going to be there? I said, this is the community, it's meant to hear the voices from the community. Uh, the industry, uh, like a DTE Energy, they're a Fortune 500 company. They get to talk a lot. They have paid lobbyists to go around to our politicians. Uh, we're a informal group. We have no budget. All we have are our voices. And so that's why we're here tonight, to express ourselves with our voices and to the people from the good people from the EPA and Allegheny County Health Department. Uh, that's why we're here. Um, and if uh, you're a member of the community, we welcome you. If you're from outside our community, uh, we welcome you also to hear our stories. Uh, if you flip to the next one. And what are we saying here? Okay. Uh, this is something... Here, I'll take this out. Okay. It's gone? There's a mic here for the oh, video oh, recording. Oh, 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 okay, all right, never mind. Uh, so this is uh, uh, something that's in the Pennsylvania State Constitution. It says that we have the right to clean air, clean water, and everything having to do with the environment, and the Commonwealth is responsible that we have that happen to us. Uh, it doesn't seem to happen enough, does it? Uh, especially if you live in our valleys here, if you live near fracking sites, uh, if you live near a coal-fired power plant, the environment takes second place. So I just thought I'd remind us of this written into our state constitution that we deserve this right, not only for us today, but for our children and our grandchildren. So uh, you might find that online and re re memorize that and talk to your local politicians. So what are you doing for me lately as far as our environment? And also industry as well, okay? Okay, we're into the agenda. And uh, 
We have some introductions to make, and that's me. So if I may ask, uh, and you can, you can rise if you will, or just wave your hand. So we have three uh, people from EPA Region 3 headquarters. That's in Philadelphia. Region 3 encompasses Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, West Virginia, and DC. Did I get that right? And Virginia, and Virginia, okay. That's a lot of area to cover. So I'll first mention David Arnold. He is Acting Director, Air Protection Division. I'll next mention Zelma Meltanada. She is Associate Director for Environment Air Protection Division. And I'll me next mention Jim Hagedorn, Senior Inspector, Enforcement Air Protection Division. And Jim, I understand you're one of the last few people who really understand the steel industry and coke plants. <laughs> So we, we need you to stay on a little bit longer. <laughs> and uh, next from ACHD, uh, we have uh, Jamie Graham, who is, uh, heads up our air quality division. And then we have uh, Dean DeLuca, who is enforcement. And then we have our epidemiologist. You can stand up. And uh, she's with us tonight to tell us about our and I'm having a mental block. Lynn Marshall. Lynn Marshall. <laughs> Lynn Marshall. <laughs> and Lynn Marshall, I should know her because she, she comes by our houses and uh, ACHD has been very good at uh, putting in VOC monitors and also now SUMA canisters funded by uh, EPA. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, going further, um, uh, no, members of our ACAM, our ACAM partners, I think that's the next slide. Okay, so we're not standing alone in this whole effort. So I list in alphabetical order, Clean Air Council, uh, CMU Create Lab, and that's the whole word for the acronym. Okay, uh, I won't say it, you can read it. So, well, I'll say it. It's Community Robotics Education and Technology Environment Lab, Group Against Smog and Pollution, uh, Heinz Endowments, Penn Environment, Penn Future, and the Sierra Club. So, uh, so we get a lot of help from them. Of uh, not too, some money on occasion, but mostly moral support. <laughs> so, and, and again, ACAN has no budget. We're an informal group. We are not organized. Uh, we are not a uh, not-for-profit organization, and we do what we do. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'm going to turn something this over now to um, Michael Bett. So these are some of his slides coming up. Thanks, Sid. Good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Bett. I'm an elected member of Ben Avon Council. ACCAN is asking for environmental justice together with uh, the seven environmental organizations just mentioned and four North Borough towns, Ben Avon, Emsworth, Bellevue, and Avalon, which all pass resolutions that seek strict enforcement of environment, environmental regulations at all plants on Neville Island. Um, as indicated by the Toxic 10 report on your chairs, Shenango is a public nuisance that is endangering public health. The plant is in a river valley subject to frequent temperature inversions uh, that creates a brownish haze of smog settling over 70,000 people that live within three miles of the plant. Under the at least five consent decrees since 1980, there's been all too little improvement in this aging facility and continuous flagrant disregard for the public's health. In fact, violations at Shenango Coke Works are not declining, but continue to rise over the past four years. We are asking that the EPA reopens the previous consent decrees. The health of our 70,000 residents far outweighs the benefit of some 140 or so regional jobs. DT Shenango has such low regard for public health that they have no, uh, no means to alert local communities in the event of a disaster or emergency. And at the meeting at the plant, when we asked what their safety plan was as, um, as they are required to have to operate, the plant manager's response was to call 911. This is unacceptable. For far too long, the profits of DT Energy, a Fortune 500 company, have been put ahead of the well-being and health of the citizens. These health costs are borne by some of our poorest communities and not the source of the pollution. 
For example, our local paper, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, review of the State Department of Environmental Protection data shows that Bellevue men are dying at a rate of 178% of the expected number of respiratory deaths. That means we would expect 100% if we were uh, normal, but it's 78% above the expected rate. <laughs> Women's death rate is at 128% in Bellevue. Avalon is similar with death rates at 138 and 111% <laughs> respectively. The city of Pittsburgh, 119 and 108%. The story is similar for many of the surrounding communities, as well as for heart disease and lung cancer. We need environmental justice in this region. According to the Pittsburgh Regional Environmental Threats, PRETA, conducted by the Center for Healthy Environments and Communities um, at the University of Pittsburgh's Graduate School of Public Health, the facility's emissions are a predominant source of cancer risk in the airhead, eclipsed only by the U.S. Steel Coke battery and Claritin. Illegal commissions continue at Shenango DTE Energy with no end in sight. Shenango Coke Works is the only heavy industry in this area with significant emissions. The fines currently imposed are insignificant in comparison to the expected profits from the 1,500 tons of coal that are processed at Shenango every day. Fines need to be raised significantly to be exponentially increased so they encourage real change and not only the cost of doing business. Two recent concerns demonstrate DTE Shenango's laissez-faire attitude. In 2013, a valve broke at the plant. This resulted in a 16-week period during which the plant was not put into hot idle, i.e. no more coke production, uh, but continued operating, spewing uh, pollution. Nearly half of the pushing operations, that's removing the coke from the ovens, resulted in air quality violations. Fadi Morad, Environmental Safety um, and Non-Utility Environmental Affairs Director at DTE Energy, and Chris Keisling, the, a previous plant manager, said the problem was because they do not understand the plant and that they were still finding surprises after four years of ownership. This is unacceptable. To cause this harm to the public's health, if this facility cannot reach and maintain the highest level of compliance to protect the public's health, then it needs to be put in height idle or permanently shut down. The area near Neville Island is heavily populated and these violations are harming our health. This year there were six power outages, some lasting over an hour. This spewed raw coke gas and its uh, associated contaminants into the atmosphere. Duquesne Light had warned DTE Energy of the need to upgrade their power, but in a predictable fashion, as per DTE Shenango's normal operating procedure, this advice had been ignored to the um, detriment of our community. I'm asking the EPA to help us provide environmental justice, reopen the consent decrees. Thank you. Uh, by the way, it's, uh, we make it sound simple that one can reopen consent decrees. It's not easy. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, EPA and ACHD folk will uh, talk about that and suggest there could be other tools at our disposal. Um, so those of us in the community may have jumped the gun saying that's possible, and I'll take ownership of part of that. Um, but we hope, we're hoping for the best. Okay. Um, Let's move on to the next slide. Um, so we have, and let's go back to the agenda slide first, okay? All right. Um, so now we have a, a statement, well, let me see. Is uh, Lewis going, are you, are you gonna say something? Okay. Oh, Angelo's gonna say something next, okay. Okay, sorry. So Angelo's gonna give us an abbreviated litany of what we've been up to over the last couple of years. Uh, my name's Angelo Torano. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And uh, a special thanks to everyone who uh, also came last November because uh, the meeting last November really inspired, uh, inspired us and gave us some momentum to 
uh, increase our advocacy for uh, clean air. Uh, and since last November, and, and as, as Thaddeus mentioned, we're a small volunteer organization, but we have, um, uh, our members are very passionate about improving air quality. Um, so in, in the past year, uh, we've been very active in, in, in our advocacy. The, um, uh, and there, there is a list, uh, I'm going to go through an, kind of an abbreviated recital of this list, but there's a list um, on the, the tables as you come in if you want to pick one up. Um, but, but since last November, um, we have done, among other things, um, we, have a, we have testified at four Board of Health meetings. Um, we've, we've met three times as a group with the um, Health Department staff. Uh, we've gotten BBC to do a story uh, about Shenango and our work, which aired on BBC World News. Uh, we met in Philadelphia with Sean Garvin, the, the Region 3 uh, EPA Administrator. Uh, seven, of us, seven of us went by train to Philadelphia for that meeting. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, Sean Garvin and his staff uh, came twice to Pittsburgh to, to uh, see Shenango firsthand and, and to meet with us. Um, on the first day of spring last year, we uh, presented Shenango with the Closed Window Award to uh, signify that we can't open our windows on, on, on nice days because of the odors and the air pollution. Um, we, um, uh, four of us bought shares in DT Shenango and in May went to their shareholder meeting in Washington, D.C. Uh, to testify about um, the pollution that Shenango is uh, throwing into the, into the community here um, and the, the health effects uh, of resident, on residents. Uh, we also initiated a stories project with the help of our, our, our friends at the Create Lab at CMU. Um, and that's a project w where we record stories of people in the community that have been impacted by um, the pollution from DTE Shenango. Um, four, four of those stories have been written up and, and are on the tables coming in uh, the, uh, as, as, you, uh, as you came in. Um, those, those are a sampling, um, and, and those, those stories really um, get across how the, uh, air pollution here is impacting residents. Uh, we also testified at County Council to, appoy, to oppose uh, the appointment of someone to the uh, Air Pollution Advisory Committee that had a clear conflict of interest because he represented Shenango. Um, we worked with the, um, the CNU Create Lab in launching the Shenango Channel that they'll be talking about later on. We got over 250 signatures on the petition that you have uh, at, at your seat, a petition that we are going to be presenting to, to EPA concerning the reopening of these consent decrees. Um, we encouraged the four boroughs, Bellevue, Avalon, Ben Avon, and uh, Emsworth to pass resolutions asking the health department to better regulate uh, the industries on Neville Island concerning air pollution. And all four of them uh, adopted those resolutions. Um, the last one just this week, the, the Avalon Council. Um, and they, they, their resolutions list uh, a number of demands. Uh, I'll just um, uh, talk about three of them. One was to ensure that the industrial plants are meeting all federal and local air quality regulations. Uh, the second one, assess fines to the maximum extent for violations uh, by these plants. And the third, uh, requiring these plants to limit their emissions on air quality days um, when uh, usually through a weather inversion, the, the air pollution just sits in the valleys and uh, the, where the, the uh, effect of that air pollution is multiplied because of that. Um, we have, we have uh, and for, for many of these uh, activities, we've gotten a lot of press coverage just to keep this issue in, in front of the public and to, to try to get the, um, the health department and our uh, other public officials to, to act uh, to clean up our air. Thank you.
I'm also going to present the, the rural resolutions to uh, Jamie Graham with the, the, uh, the Health Department and Dave Otto with EPA. Th thank you, Angela. Um, Lewis, are you up next? And you can. Lewis is another co founder. We who have blue shirts are so honored to have uh, blue shirts, frankly. <laughs> okay. Not red shirts. Not red shirts. Red shirts always get killed. <laughs> um, my name is Lewis, um, Bellevue resident, uh, member of Allegheny County Clean Air Now. Um, and what does the Bible say? Uh, Yea, though I walk through the valley in the shadow of death. Over there, you see the shadow of death. My wife and my, myself, we live in the shadow of death. Your kids live in the shadow of death. You live in the shadow of death. What do we have, 50% higher rates of um, asthma, heart disease, cancer here? Um, my wife has asthma. Um, we come from New York. Uh, we came here about six years ago. And um, New York's not the cleanest city in the world. I remember seeing rats bigger than my arm there, cockroaches the size of my hand. You know? And yet her asthma was never as bad as it is here. And I'm sure some of you have experienced it. Northgate High School here has terrible asthma rates. And I guess the question is, do you want to do something about it? Do you want to continue living in the shadow of death or not? Um, and uh, the question I have, I guess, is right now is we want you know, to convince the Allegheny County Health Department and the Environmental Protection Agency to reopen the 2012 and 2014 consent decrees and to do whatever else is necessary to reduce violation emissions from DTE Shenango. You know, Allegheny County Clean Air Now wants a place at the table, too. We don't want to just have these negotiations going on behind closed doors. That's been happening for too long now. These doors need to be open. We need some transparency as to what the heck's going on. I mean, the fines for violations at Shenango are as little as $500. That's a parking ticket. Parking ticket for people. And these, this company's killing us. All right? I mean, this, this is a multi-billion dollar company. And I know Pittsburgh has a legacy of steel, and I respect that legacy. It's an important legacy. But DTE is not a Pittsburgh company. They're a Michigan company. Those guys are earning dividends and capital gains off of our backs and our lungs. And they're not even here. They're not living here. And it's time for a change. So right now, if you look on your chair, there's a little blue slip. That's a petition. Um, it's a postcard petition. And uh, it's asking you to just, you know, sign the petition to get the EPA and the ACHD to do its job and protect us. Um, you know, what is it? if you're walking through the shadow of, the death, shadow of death, the rod in your staff is supposed to comfort you. But right now, it doesn't seem like it's comforting us. The EPA and the ACHD are the rod in the staff. And we need them to open this consent decree and do something. Thank you. I, I really like Lewis. He's a New Yorker, and I used to live in New York. I appreciate New Yorkers. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, the next on their agenda will be, let me see if I can see this right. Um, okay. We're moving into statements of need. So we have a few key speakers here uh, who are going to stand up for us and talk about uh, what they're doing and how they're helping us. So first we'll call on the CREATE lab. And we, I just told you what that stands for. There's a test at the end of the evening. <laughs> okay. And R Randy Sargent is here, so he's the lead person. And we have three others. Ilya, Paul, and B. Okay. And Yencha. And Yencha. Okay. Uh, so the mic needs to stay there. But we're, to We're honored at Carnegie Mellon to be uh, involved in collaborating as well as we can with uh, Allegheny County Clean Air Now. I just want to say 10 seconds worth, and I'll turn it over to Randy Sargent, who leads the visualization and machine learning work that we're doing on this problem uh, for Allegheny County Clean Air Now and for Shenango. The uh, thing that we believe and that we think is really important for everybody to understand is that we can invent new technologies but we can do it in the service of public good. We can make technologies that cause local communities 
to be able to have just as much power over data, data that helps them make a case intelligently, a case backed up with evidence that they can take to officials like our friends who are visiting from the EPA. So we believe in constantly refining that data and creating new tools that the public can use so the public has just as much information about what's happening transparently as used to be the purview of government and corporation. And so I'll turn it over to Randy for that. Thanks everyone for having us here today. Uh, you've seen a number of these videos from Shenango. You see them all over the, the screen on the right or on your, your left uh, and, and up here now. Um, these are from a pair of cameras. One was set up by a community member here um, and one was set up by the, the county health department. And these are being continuously recorded every five seconds. And we can go back through those and find the sorts of events we're looking at here. So the, the event we're looking at just on this one is the power failure back from June. Um, it was perhaps one of the, one of the worst events we've seen. Um, flip to the next slide, please. Here's an assortment of events from the month before, just from, from May. And you'll see the different sorts of emissions coming out of Shenango are different colors. You see black, you see brown, you see yellow, you see blue. And each one of these different colors represents different sorts of substances that are, that are coming out, um, none of which are, are good for us to breathe. Um, keep going. So the, the community here has a, a long history of watching Shenango. There's a, there's a group called the, the Smoke Watchers that will go out and actually take a clipboard and, and wait for an hour and watch the different um, parts of Shenango and what they're emitting. And in the, in the tradition of that, we've set up a way for these cameras, which again the community and the health department set up, to be able to go look at these cameras and watch Shenango. So instead of spending an hour out at Metro Motors, you can spend an hour at your computer and see maybe a whole day in the, in the fast forward. And what you're seeing here is a document put together. This is, I think, from, from June this past year, from volunteers across um, through, through ACAN going through and finding all the different um, emissions events. And this is a 70-page document, so you probably can't even see the whole thing from, from back where you are. Um, in service of finding events and not taking as long to, to look through them, Ying Cha in the, in the audience, raise your hand, Ying Cha, uh, wrote some interesting computer algorithms to locate the smoke. So if you go to the next uh, tab, this is, this is um, a set of smoke events, emissions events, fugitive emissions events, um, over the course of a few months. So actually this, this first document is only two months worth and I don't think we'll get to the end of it. <coughs> then we're, we're still like maybe 20% into it. So you get, you get the idea and that's, so we have, we have thousands and thousands of these, of these things going on where you can see things. Now when you look at, when you look at Shenango, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between steam and the smoke, um, but uh, but believe me, all these, all these are smoke and not, not steam. Um, it's a good, we'll, we'll, we'll share the link to this and you can take a look. Um, next, uh, next tab. So what we'd like to show tonight, um, for the first time now in public, is what we call the Shenango Channel. And we built this in conjunction with the, the folks of ACAN. We, we designed it to have the two cameras and to have also a, a, a set of other information about what's happening to the air. So if we look up at the top, you'll see there's a video, and what we're seeing is, is actually from, from today, and the, it's, uh, I don't know if, if we're gonna have a good enough network to, to show the video live, but this is actually the live website that we're, that we're pulling up. If you go look around the page, you'll see kind of on the, the bottom right, you'll see a map of the area, and you see a few little bars, a little bar graph and a little arrow showing which direction the wind's going. On the lower left, what you'll see is line charts showing you different sensors in the area showing particulates in the air. The top one is actually the, the county particulate, PM 2.5, and you want to see that generally below 12. 
um, and it goes above 12 a lot here. Um, and uh, then the, the ones below that are, are in individual community members' um, homes, out, outside the homes. So let's see if we can maybe, um, we may be off on the network here. So, yeah, I, th I think we may, we may have a, a problem with the wireless, I apologize. Um, you know, it's, it's remarkable to me watching the events through the, through the camera and for the first times, you know, coming out here and setting up the cameras. Um, I heard stories from people in the community and some of the stories were, were kind of hard to believe. Like, you know, things were a lot worse on the weekends than the weekdays and, and th things like this. But the, the, evidence, the evidence bears it out. I mean, see, seeing this, it's, it's kind of hard to dispute what, what we actually see. So let, let's, uh, let's uh, zoom out a bit on the chart on the bottom there. Like, so Ela's going to zoom out. And what you're seeing across the very top there is all these little red and yellow dots, if you can see them. Hopefully, you can, you can see them even from the back. Those are all reports of smells. So in addition to the images, in addition to the measurements of particulates, we have people in there using their cell phone reporting smell levels, and the red ones are the worst ones. And you see it's mostly, it's mostly red ones. Um, if we zoom out enough, you'll see, you'll see them month after month, week after week. Uh, we have you know, hundreds and hundreds of these reports, and these are especially the things that tend to be clustered around, around the weekends and the, and the evenings. So why don't we, oh, if we can, is that gonna show up? So I think, I think let's, uh, so we, we may be able to demonstrate more of this later when, when the network's back on, but, but let's go ahead and skip to the next, the next slide. Uh, but I encourage you, before, before we leave the, the Shenango channel, if you go to Shenango channel, all one word, shenangochannel.org, um, you'll be able to see this yourself. You'll be able to go and see for yourself. You don't have to like trust us what Shenango looks at, you know, look at for yourself. There are tools on there when you find something that you want to email to someone else. You can say share, and you can draw a little rectangle around the thing that happened, and pay, copy it and paste it into your email and send it off, and it'll send a little animated GIF for, for people who know what that is. So let's go to the next slide. This is the cell phone app that lets you report smell and at the moment, it's not easy to get, you can't download it from the App Store yet, so if you are interested to report smells and have it show up in the public, um, come talk to us afterwards and we'll set you up. Um, next slide, please. What we found, in addition to the smells being clustered on the, on the weekends, we also find that with, with some of the people who are recording the smells, when you get the very worst smells, we had what are called summa canisters to take a grab sample of the air and actually see, well, what's in the air? When it smells bad, you know, is it actually bad for you? The, the answer is yes. It's hard to see on the print here. I apologize. I, I should have made this a little bit bigger. But one of the things you would see there is 10, about 9, nine or to 10 parts per billion benzene, which is, which is really too high. We don't want to be breathing, breathing that level of benzene. Um, next slide, please. So in, in summary, we see Shenango polluting the air. You, know, you, you can see it graphically. It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to disagree. We believe, based on what we're seeing, that Shenango is in regular violation of fugitive emission permit. So the permit says you can emit certain types of things in certain places. And we see things that we believe, that, we, that we're pretty sure, are in violation of that permit. But it's also, I have to say, it's also hard to prove because the views from our cameras can't see the precise location of the emission. Keep going. We also believe Shenango is in violation of permit by emitting these nuisance or odors. Once again, this is a hard thing to prove to say it was Shenango and not something else on Neville Island, but based on what we see, we believe it's that. Again, we need to get more evidence to be able to make this um, this violation stick. But it's clear to us, looking at, at the images and looking at the, the, uh, the reports of smell, that that's what's happening. It's, it's coming from Shenango. Um, we see that the, that the smell reports correlate with toxic air. So if you smell it and it smells bad, you probably do want to be inside. 
And finally, we know that it's possible to get better evidence. Uh, we know that it's possible to put cameras with a better view. There are better places to put sensors. Um, and we need cooperation to, to cite those. Um, we believe from the earlier um, consent decree that ACHD, um, the health department, has the, the ability to put devices to measure. So for example, a camera that can actually see the point of emission, you know, which we would be happy to, to uh, provide. That's, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. We are extremely, extremely fortunate to have people of the caliber from the CMU Create Lab work with us. Um, I, I just, I'm just astounded. Um, uh, Randy came out to my place in Benavent and personally set up these spec monitors. They're still, they're still B monitors, right? Uh, um, but just to verify their particulate readings that we're getting off the Avalon monitor. So he personally came out and set up these devices in our homes and our residences. So kudos to you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I, I'm sorry, I have to mention that. So we get Randy from NASA. <laughs> and guess what he was doing at NASA at one time? He was mapping the surface of Mars. Right? Did I say that right? <laughs> He's a little humble about that. So if he can map Mars, he can map Shenango. <laughs> okay. So thank you for being here with us. Okay. Um, and of course the rest of the Create Lab people. Uh, let's move on to uh, now to change horses a bit. Uh, we have with us a religious leader, uh, Father John Geitzer. He is the chaplain for Little Sisters of the Poor. And we like to think this is also a morality issue. And thank you, Pope Francis, for coming to our country and spreading the news in his encyclical. Uh, and Father John may share some of his kind words with us. Thank you. I appreciate being invited here. But I have to say, this is the first time I've gone to church to look at dirty pictures. <laughs> what I'm going to read to you is just an overview of some of uh, the Pope's writing in the recent encyclical on the environment that he calls On Care for Our Common Home. So this, I'll make this very brief. Praise be to you, my Lord, through our sister Mother Earth. This sister now cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods with which God has endowed her. The destruction of the human environment is extremely serious, not only because God has entrusted the world to us, but because human life is itself a gift which must be defended. St. Francis of Assisi is the example par excellence of care for the vulnerable and of an integral e ecology. He was particularly concerned for God's creation and for the poor and outcast. The environmental challenge we are undergoing and its human roots concern and affect us all. Exposure to atmospheric pollutants produced a broad spectrum of health hazards, especially for the poor, and causes millions of premature deaths. Our industrial system, at the end of its cycle of production and consumption, has not developed the capacity to absorb and reuse waste and byproducts. There is an urgent need to develop policies so that the emission of carbon dioxide and other highly polluting gases can be drastically reduced. A sober look at our world shows that the degree of human intervention, often at the service of business interests and consumerism, is actually making our Earth less rich and beautiful. We can be silent witnesses 
to terrible injustices if we think that we can obtain significant benefits by making the rest of humanity, present and future, pay the extremely high costs of environmental deterioration. Never have we so hurt and mistreated our common home as we have in the last 200 years. On many concrete questions, the church has no reason to offer a definitive opinion. But we need only take a frank look at the facts to see that our common home is falling into serious disrepair. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Father John. I might add to that the EPA has a website, which we can all go to, which uh, cites the demographics around the Shenango plant. So within a three-mile radius of Shenango live 70,000 of us, pretty highly dense population. And if you look at the demographics for income, one-third of us, one-third of us live below the poverty line. That's outrageous. We have an environmental justice area. We talk about it, but nobody does anything about it. So thank you, Father John, for reminding us of our responsibilities. Okay, next um, we'll have a health professional <laughs> be with us, uh, and that's uh, Martha Haley. She is a radiation oncologist. Thanks for asking me to speak this evening. I'm Marsha Haley, actually. Sorry, Ted. <laughs> um, I'm a radiation oncologist and assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm here tonight out of concern for the people that live and work in close proximity to the DE DTE Shenango Coke plant. Now, we know that Pittsburgh and Allegheny County have come a long way since 70 years ago when we used to have to turn the street lights on at noon in order to see through the smog. But although our air quality has improved over time, it's still not where it should be. We continually make the national list of the worst air quality, and I'm sure that we can do better. When I talk to the Allegheny County Health Department about our poor air quality, an issue that continually comes up is the coke plants. EPA classifies coke oven emissions as a group A, which are human carcinogens. Several of the byproducts of concern are polycyclic aromatic, aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, heavy metals, and coal tar volatiles, including benzene. Contact with these substances increases one's risk of cancer. Two years ago, the University of Pittsburgh School of Public Health published a study that showed that the residents of Allegheny County have an increased risk of cancer compared to those living in surrounding areas due to our air pollution. We also know that air pollution effect affects non-cancer respiratory illnesses, such as asthma. In fact, the highest asthma rates in Allegheny County schools happen to be in the areas around the coke plants. As a physician, I believe it's critical that we address this. Fines are not going to protect the people of the North Boroughs. Controlling the emissions will. Episodes like the venting of raw coke that occurred this spring are absolutely unacceptable. Three weeks ago, I met with the EPA and White House in Washington, D.C. to address air quality issues, so I know that this administration is forward thinking on these particular issues. I'm hoping that this meeting will facilitate working together to address the issues that we're talking about tonight and improving the air quality for Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. Thank you. Sorry I misspoke, I was excited that you were here. <laughs> I'm human too, okay. Uh, so next we will have a, a researcher from CMU, Dr. Albert Presto. And uh, if you've seen a little white van bristling with antenna in your neighborhoods, uh, that he may not be the driver, but he's the one responsible for collecting pollution data on a localized basis. Albert. All right, I have to set my timer because the, the long version of this takes an hour. 
So uh, really quickly, I'm going to try and give an overview. Basically, what we've done over the past few years is, is try and understand how air pollution changes over space in the county. Um, and so I'm going to show several maps to sort of motivate this. Um, I don't expect everyone to sort of suck in all the details because I'm going to go too fast. But any red, red colors and darker colors are going to be higher concentrations. Sort of blue colors and lighter colors are going to be lower concentrations. Right? And really what we're going to be focusing on are, um, are the variations and the differences. Um, so we can go to the next one. So basically everything I'm going to show you is backed up with real data. So these are our vans. We did a lot of mobile sampling. Um, just really quick, the one on the left that's just a plain white van gets pulled over all the time, and the one on the right never, like I drove around with that one for a month with like an expired registration and one of the mirrors off and never got pulled over. <laughs> um, so, okay, so, uh, so yeah, go ahead to the next one. So we've, we've mapped a lot of pollutants and, and I know people here have, have seen various uh, versions of these. This one is, 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 is for black carbon particulate matter, so it's stuff that you see out of the, you know, the stack of a, of a diesel bus, and if you're sitting towards the front or have really good eyes, you can see this one has a road contribution, so the roads are these really thin little um, red areas. Um, but then you see these red blobs, and a lot of those blobs um, are either in the river valley and or near industrial areas. And so if you go to the next one, um, and I apologize, the color contrast on this one isn't quite as good, this is for per chromium, which is another component of particulate matter in the right state. It can be carcinogenic. It's classified as an air toxic. Um, and this doesn't have a roadway component, so you don't see the roads on here. You just sort of see the variation um, closer to industrial areas. It's, again, apologize that the color contrast is not so great. Um, and, and one thing we've done and, and, um, is we've worked with some health uh, folks at Colorado State University. And as you would expect, if you live in sort of the darker areas, your risk goes up, right? Um, because you're, you're exposed to higher levels of things. Um, so go to the, yeah, we'll do this one. Um, so those were both examples of, of stuff in particulate matter. Um, we can also care about gases, so benzene is, is a carcinogen. So here the darker colors are, are higher concentrations. Now instead of sort of mapping in high detail, we've zoned some areas. Um, but if you see the area that we're in now is not the darkest, that actually happens to be the east end of Pittsburgh and we're, not, we're still trying to understand why that is. Um, but you still see where we are standing right now is in one of the higher areas, right? So if you were to move <coughs> north of here, you know, you would have experienced lower concentrations. Um, so skip the next one and yeah, there we go. And for these particular gases that we go around and, and, and measure, if you just look at the top 5%, like the highest 5% of the concentrations that we measure, um, overwhelmingly they're, they're in sort of two areas, right? One is this eastern part of Pittsburgh. Some of them are spread around, but then there's a bunch that are in this area. Right, and we know, basically, we know what the sources are, right? The sources, we know where the roads are, we know where the major industrial sources are, and, and, and we sort of find high concentrations in areas downwind of that. But it's not necessarily, you don't just have to be right next to the source. Um, these stationary sources have these big plumes that can sort of waft over big areas. So next one is my last one. Um, and this is, I, this is actually some, some modeling work we did. This is dispersion modeling, acknowledging that the dispersion model doesn't always work perfectly for areas with, with all of the valleys that we have. Uh, and this is actually an, an example, this is a model for the Liberty Clareton area, not for here. But the colors you can see, so the, the, where the green dot is and where it's sort of red is, is, is right near um, the industrial area in the Mon Valley. And then the sort of plume sort of travels over, over big areas. Um, and and, and th this plume you can actually see in, in, in lots of areas of the county and the same with, with industrial areas. And, you know, if you have big emissions from a stationary source, they can get carried by the wind and cover sort of big swaths of area and impact people pretty far downwind who maybe not, aren't necessarily aware um, that they're being exposed. So thank you, everyone. And that was my last one. <laughs>so I posed the question when I asked Albert if we can come to our session tonight. So if you happen to be watching a Steeler game, which I was at one last this past weekend, and the we had an inversion and the winds were right, or maybe even still, could you be breathing in Shenango? Yes. 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 Right yes. That could happen. That could happen. And so while you're happy. But they don't go that way too often. They come our way more often than not. <laughs> okay, so that's a possibility. So think about that the next time you're tailgating uh, down at the Steeler or Pirates game and uh, figure out which way the wind's blowing. Okay.
Uh, you do that for the weather, don't you? So we now have the Shenango Channel. You can see which way the wind's blowing from the Shenango Channel as well. Okay. Okay, so next we're going to have um, is uh, ma the mayor of Emsworth here. Ah, she's here. Would you like to come up and say a few words? Okay, okay. I'm sorry. So Mary is the uh, mayor of Demsworth. Uh, so her council passed a resolution. She and she oh, the mic, my <laughs> Uh, and her council unanimously passed the resolution where we're asking the health department to do their maximum of their capabilities of keeping pollution under control from Neville Island. Of course, the, the, the main polluter is Shenango. So thank you, Mary, for being here, and we thank your council members for passing the resolution. Uh, I'd like to, by the way, we invited a whole slew of people to be here, including Senator Casey and Senator Toomey and Mike Doyle, but they're not here. <laughs> uh, but they know we're here. Uh, but I'd like to recognize uh, Brian O'Malley, who is from Adam Ravenstall's office. He made it here tonight. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to recognize Vicki Donnelly from the Avalon um, Borough Council. Thank you. So I guess the other people were busy, uh, but they know we're they know that we're here. Yes. Oh, please, oh yeah. So uh, the Councilwoman Darlene Harris is represented, and tell me the name again. Lloyd. Okay, Lloyd is here tonight. In fact, we made a cold call on uh, Darlene Harris's office the other day, and she act actually let us in. <laughs> and uh, thanks to Kathleen. Kathleen lives in Brighton Heights, so she's the main beneficiary, and thank you for being here. Okay? Um, so now we're going to move on to, uh, well, we, we're, di we're describing it as consent decree, but we can't. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, uh, and we, we really are opening up this next so am I missing something? Oh, no, uh, Leah, Leah, okay. Um, Leah has the last say in our statements of need, and Leah is, a, I think she's a real charmer. <laughs> uh, she has two young children, and she's out there with her children a lot showing up at things. Are they here tonight? They're here tonight. They're all here. <laughs> um, Orion and Dimitri, how are you? <laughs> and she went, to, she and her family went to, there they are. <laughs> And she and her family went to Philadelphia with us, and actually they met Sean Garvin too. <laughs> okay, so uh, she's a real trooper. Okay, after you. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Leah Andrasik. My family and I live in Avalon. We're less than a thousand yards downwind of Shenango. Uh, for the past 13 years, we've lived in close proximity to the plant on one side of the river or the other. Uh, but it wasn't until my oldest child was born, that, um, born prematurely, that I became acutely aware of the fact that the emissions from the plant contain a cocktail of toxic chemicals. When I found this out, I quickly realized that my grandfather's livelihood was very likely a cause of his heart and lung issues. He was a proud and active member of the union, and he spent his whole career on Neville Island working in one of the mills. And while I'm extremely, extremely proud of the hard work that he did and the time that he put into advocating for workers' rights with the union, I'm saddened that for the past 20 years, my grandmother and our family has been without him, most likely as a result of this work. And so I come to this with a unique perspective of wanting to protect the future of my children, but also wanting to honor the rich history of all those who fought so hard to protect workers' rights. My hope is that the steelworkers here this evening will make my grandfather and all those who fought before him for workers' rights proud 
and join us, the community, in demanding better from this billion dollar company. You and I and my children should not have to bear the brunt of this corporation's unwillingness to address issues before they turn into emergencies. I don't want your children or your grandchildren to have to watch you suffer these ill health effects. I want you to be able to enjoy your retirement without oxygen machines or heart surgeries plaguing it. And most importantly, I just want my children to be able to play outside in their own backyard without fear of what they're breathing in or needing to run indoors because of the terrible odors. You see the power outage that happened. We were outside during that time period, less than a thousand yards away. This company needs to abide by the existing laws and regulations just like the rest of us do. They should not be allowed to circumvent these laws in order to profit particularly when it puts all of us at risk. Thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, Leah has shared with us they're thinking of moving on soon because it's too risky of a place for her and her family to live. And that's what we're up against. I had a neighbor across the street from me who moved because of her condition with di being a diabetic. And the, she, she believes, and her doctors believe, that the pollution source here from Neville Island caused that to happen. They moved several months ago. Not a pretty sight. Um, so now we're going to an area which we have our our invited guests from the EPA and ACHD to talk to us. Um, and we, we put it under the rubric of consent decrees. I guess we're, we're moving ahead too quickly with that idea. And so I apologize for that. I got excited that I thought maybe we could talk about that. <laughs> uh, but instead, uh, we'll talk about things that may lead, work around that or some solutions to our issues uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So I offer up Jamie Graham. Thank you for inviting me and all of us here tonight. Um, when Thaddeus talked to us about coming here, he, he wanted to keep it short because this is your meeting to hear where, where you have to say. So I only have a few slides I wanted to talk. He, uh, the two questions he asked me were consent orders and the electric outages that, that's happened this year. And so that's what I'm gonna speak on is those two, those two issues. Um, and we can pull it up. Yeah, it's, it's, they're short, but it's just, it'll help to go through it. There are two consent uh, two decrees that we're under right now. Now, a consent decree or a consent order is an agreement between two parties. It could be about anything. This, in this case, it's air pollution. It's about air pollution. Um, if it's filed in a court, um, then the decree becomes owned by the court, and the court owns it. And we have two decrees that we're working on right now with Shenango. It's not unusual. It's, it's um, we have, you know, we sometimes I'll have different decrees. They are on different subjects and on different issues. And so let's go ahead to the first slide. And the first one that we're working under is the 2012, which is a federal consent decree. It's filed in the federal court. It's between us, EPA, and Shenango and maybe even DEP, because there's water issues in there. Um, I'm getting a nod, so DEP as well. So all of us have been in the federal court, not me, but my predecessors were in federal court to, um, to agree upon this, this consent decree. And there are three parts to it. One was clean air compliance. One is emission monitoring, which is the stack. Now this is, and this one's pretty much, the second one is really the stack, the stack having a monitor that continually measures the stack. And the third was some clean water. And I'm not going to really go into clean water because I don't know much about it and, and to, since today is an air issue. So if we go on to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about these things. Um, the Clean Air Act compliance requirements in the 2012 consent decree is the combustion stack standards. There's a particulate standard and then there's the two opacity standards. And I think most of you know the two opacity standards, 20, no more than 20% opacity over more than three minutes of an hour 
and not more than 60% opacity at any time during that hour. And those are the, those are, and then the actual grain loading particulate standards. So those are the three standards that are in uh, the consent decree. There's also a number of inspection and maintenance activities that they have to do. There's some things they have to do on an annual basis, things they have to do every time there's an exceedance. There's a number of tests they have to do, reviews they have to do, and reports they have to put together. And then a whole list of N-flu repairs. Now N-flu is if you have your oven, you have like about 29 heating elements going all the way down the edge from one inch to the other. The, these flues at the end, the end flues, are more likely to get credit up because the door is open, the door is closed. You got your 18, uh, probably there's some uh, steel workers in here can explain this a lot better than me, but, but as you open the doors, you close the doors, the temperature difference makes those end flues go bad faster than the ones in the middle. So what was in the 2012 consent decree was a list of end flues that needed to be repaired over a certain period of time and any kind of welding that needed to be done around them. So those were the things that were in, that were in and are in the federal consent decree. And as Ted said, I think we had some confusion here. We're not looking to open either consent decree actually at this time. Uh, we don't know if we can because again, it belongs to the federal court. It doesn't belong to us. But what we are looking at is going through line by line through the consent decree to make sure that everything is, is in order. Everything is being done to minimize. Now this one is for the stack emissions, like I said. Um, everything here is based on the stack emissions. The end flue repairs will also affect how many stack emissions there are. So that's what this consent decree is for. The stack emissions, the end flues, and the maintenance of the battery itself a good running battery will not have stack emissions. So it's a, that's really the test of whether the battery is running well, is of the stack emissions. Now 2014, we were working on that locally. We'll go on to the next slide. Uh, 2014, now this is a consent order. This was a consent order agreement. It became a decree. We did go into state court with this. Um, uh, this was between us, Shenango, and the state court. So it's, it's a, now it does not do the stack because there's already a consent decree for the stacks. This is to do with some other things. Now there were some repairs that needed to be done. We had a lot of fugitive emissions. So what we required and they agreed to is they were gonna replace all the sheeting on the pushing emission control. There's a shed. When you push the emissions out, there's a shed to capture the emissions. But over the years, they had rotted, it, it deteriorates and there's all kinds of leaks coming out of it. We said, okay, within a certain amount of time, you're gonna replace any sheets, they're bad. They've done that. They came up with this, it's a bit of an innovative thing, is to have it extending the shed closer to the quench tower. Now there's a danger there, because the quench tower is full of water, and the shed can't have water in it. So you get too close, you're gonna, you have the chance of getting water from the quench tower into the shed area. Um, but they designed it well, it seems to be working. And so that, that, was their, uh, that was part of the consent decree. The third is to have a, a bag house maintenance. We were having some problems with their bag houses. They put in a new maintenance plan. We approved it. They are operating a bag, ma bag maintenance plan. And the fourth, fourth one was to take pushing emission values every day. Um, we have inspectors out there. Um, we have our inspectors out there every weekday. We have contract inspectors out there every day and they have their inspectors out. Um, based on the pushing emissions, and that's the emissions when you actually push the cook out, they have to adjust their cooking time, extend the cooking time. Again, it's a condition of if the battery is not operating well, you're gonna have emissions when you open the door and you push it out. So you either have to cook longer if the battery's not working well. So that's, there's a calculation in there that you have to change your cooking time if your pushing emissions are out of compliance. Um, they're, they're, so far, most of the time, it's been not, not an issue. But that's, you know, that's where, and so we get a daily count from their reviews and what our reviews, what the values are, and what the minimum cooking time has to be. They've mostly been above the minimum cooking time, so it's not been, a, been an issue. So this is the, that's the 2014. So you see, it's not like there's, there's two different consent decrees on two different parts of the, of the, of the uh, of the plant. Now that doesn't excuse anything. They are still required to follow all of our 
permit requirements, all of our regulations, and all of the federal regulations. There aren't any state regulations that relate directly to, to this plant, but federal, local, and the permit conditions in addition to the consent, the two consent decrees. And so that's where we stand on the, on the consent decrees. Now, um, the, the other question that Thaddeus was asking about was the, uh, the, the electrical outages. And we'll go on to the next slide and talk a little bit about that. Um, we have been meeting with Chenango. They have been meeting with Duquesne Light. Um, and there's motion in progress. Again, most of you know there were some outages. There's been outages all the way back 2006. There's a, uh, um, but significantly this year, there was I think six. I think in fact I think I have them all listed there. Six this year. One, two, three, four, five, seven. There were seven this year. Um, some of them only last. The one that only lasts six seconds. But the problem with it is, as soon as there's two there's two electric lines that come into the plant. And if one goes down, the other one goes right into place. So, but even if it's six seconds, what happens is that because of safety issues, the boiler has to stop operating. And when a boiler shuts down, it takes a full 30 minutes for it to come back up again. All that time, the cook oven gas is not being pulled off the battery. So, and so it has to be flared because it's a safety issue. You've got to take care of that. So um, that's been a problem. Now, the slides you were showing that, that you were, I think Randy, you were showing before um, the two outages this year that were the really bad ones. Um, now we're still looking into the June 11th one, see what, what caused all that. The May uh, incident was the one where the actual Larry car, the charging car, caught fire. Because when the power went down, the Larry car was stuck where it was and it already had a lid open. So you have all this gas coming up, it catches fire, the Larry car catches. It was a few million dollars, they had the, the, the unit was down. Uh, it was very dangerous for, for their employees uh, to, deal with, to deal with that incident because they lost the electricity. So um, what we have been, I don't think I have another slide off of this, right? Okay, it talks about the May, uh, May event. And it just it says the issues, but that, again, this is pretty much what I, what I said. They were in the middle of charging, and the char because they were in the middle of charging when they lost the electricity, uh, the the Larry car, the traveling car, or the charging car uh, caught fire, and um, there's a there was a whole issue there. So what we're doing, um, what we're doing with them, or what they're doing, I don't do I have another slide on there? Am I done? Okay. Um, Shenanga has been talking to us. They've been talking to, to Duquesne Light. Duquesne Light has been out and has done, has looked at a lot, number of places where there have been poor connection. It looks like that they have let a lot of the, the, the wiring deteriorate in the area. And um, they've gone through and they're checking it and, and correcting a lot of the electrical distribution where they've got it. Uh, Shenango and Duquesne Light have been walking the lines and checking everything on, on to see if what needs to be changed and if there can be reconnections in such a way that would not that would prevent this shutdown, even a six minute or six second shutdown. They're still working on that, they're still looking at that. What our part is, is we're in the process of getting a consultant to go into the plant to look at all of their uh, actions during an outage, which would be anything, including electric outage, but this is the more pro predominant one and the more one of concern, is to go through their process during electric outage and say, is everything that can be done, done? And if not, why not? What will it cost? And then we're going to require them to do it. We have to go through the process and, and find out what's out there, what can, what can happen. So that's what we're in the middle of right now. We're in the process of uh, putting out a request for proposals for a consultant that, can, that has the talent to be able to understand coke plants and go in and do that process. They're going to review everything that happens during an outage and give us recommendations and says, okay, it would be better if you can do this. It can be better if you installed this. It'd be better. And then we work from there. So that's where we are right now in the electric outages. We believe that with the, the work that Duquesne Light's already done, of course, it's going to be less often that there'll be outages. But we want to be a place where it doesn't matter if there's electric outages, that the plant is still safe. That's where we need to be. We can't just say, OK, sorry, the electric, electricity isn't working today. So that's where we're working on and what now. 
So that's it. I don't know, Dave, if you have anything to add to, to the activities. We've been working with EPA on, on Shenango. Uh, I know that you guys have been talking to EPA, and so we want to continue to work with them to have their help. And Jim's expertise is very helpful uh, in, in whatever, in what controls we can put in. So. I just make a comment as a segue uh, for David coming up. Uh, <clears throat> we're very, very interested in this consultant coming in and exploring the plant. Because uh, I, uh, so we're, yeah, so we're jointly excited. Um, and uh, as having been a, a, a almost double E by training, I understand a little bit about electrical situations. And uh, the, the fact that it can't always be the supplier who's at fault. <clears throat> Uh, so maybe they were drawing too much current. <laughs> what do you think? That happens in your house when your circuit breaker clicks off, doesn't it? <laughs> so there's, I think they described it as an une unexplained fault that occurred. So maybe we can investigate that a bit more. Okay, uh, so Dave, would you please come up? And whoever else might, you might have. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Dave Arnold with uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in the Philadelphia office. Uh, thanks, Ted, for the invitation. Thanks, everybody at ACAN. Uh, I do not have prepared remarks. I don't want to bore you guys. Uh, I think you're probably wondering, well, who is Dave and, and you know, what, what is he doing in Philadelphia to help the situation? So uh, I grew up in Beaver County, uh, spent the first 20 years of my life uh, living across from a coke plant uh, owned by JNL Steel. So I do have some understanding of what it's like uh, to live near a coke plant. <clears throat> uh, to give you a sense of our role versus the county health department's role, some of you may know it, but uh, it, it's probably good to, to have that understanding. The Federal Clean Air Act, um, which charges EPA with cleaning up the environment, also establishes uh, a section of it that the states and, and local governments have the right and the ability to implement laws and develop air pollution plans. So that is the case in Pennsylvania. Um, <clears throat> the State Air Pollution Contr Control Act actually uh, provides the authority for Allegheny County as well as Philadelphia County to exist and run an environmental program. So what do we do? Uh, we do have an oversight function. Uh, we believe it's a helpful function. Uh, uh, not everyone likes to see EPA show up uh, and ask what they're doing, but uh, I will say I've known Jamie for over 30 years. Uh, there's probably no one in the Mid-Atlantic area that has more knowledge uh, and the ability to run a program. So I, I tip my hat to Jamie. Uh, it's a lot of tough issues out here, so uh, she does a great job. So we have an oversight role. We also have sort of a technical assistance role, a financial assistance role. Uh, so we do support the program financially, um, and we also support it technically. So uh, that's why I brought our, our senior inspector, Jim Hagedorn, along. Um, he is our guy. Uh, we used to have many. We now have one uh, due to retirements. Uh, and I will say it's very difficult to get the younger generation interested uh, in this kind of environmental work. Uh, <clears throat> Don't know why that is, but uh, it is uh, engineers coming out now. Uh, in fact, we lost a couple a few years ago to the oil and gas industry. We just cannot compete uh, salary-wise with some of, uh, some of those entities. Uh, but anyway, Jim is here, uh, and he is here to provide support to the county. Uh, Selma Madonado, our enforcement chief, is here. Uh, and I think we're now at a stage, we've had many discussions with Jamie and her staff, uh, where we now are a full team and uh, we will bring all the federal resources that we have to help address this, this situation. And I know there's been discussions about consent decrees and reopening and uh, there's certain things I can't discuss uh, as an enforcement officer. Uh, it's not appropriate to discuss certain things, but I will tell you we are looking at all the options. We're looking at the current consent decree, at least the federal consent decree, uh, to make sure that we haven't missed anything. Uh, the document is huge, so 
uh, is very easy to overlook something. So we're, we're looking at that. Uh, we're looking at all the regulations. As Jamie said, it's not just a consent decree. There are a lot of rural, federal and, and uh, county rules that we want to make sure we're not missing anything. Uh, because what, what you see uh, in the video over there, uh, in my mind, is totally unacceptable. So. So with that, I, again, I don't want to go through a bureaucratic speech. I, I hate them myself. I, I, you guys probably do too. Uh, so I'm looking forward to having some discussions either during the Q&A session or after the meeting is over. I would be happy to have uh, some discussions with you guys. So thanks again for the invitation. We don't often get out to Allegheny County in my home area from years ago. Uh, so we really we do appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> So we don't have anyone talking from the re either one of the groups further. Just checking. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, just as a, a sideline with uh, meeting Dave for the first time in Philadelphia, we realized that uh, I think we're about the same era. I, I graduated from New Brighton High School in Beaver County. Fierce rivals with Rochester High School. And. Uh, I don't know if we won any games against or not. I give up. <laughs> I can't remember that far back. Uh, and I think we both speak, speak the same language, Western Pennsylvanese, or something like that. Uh, and we, and just as another aside, there was something called the ABC Drive-In in Baden. And it was right across the river from the JNL Steelworks. Okay? And we were amazed between movies, you could see the, the furnace open up. It was like fireworks as wow, isn't that great? And then molten slag got poured down the riverbank into the river. It was like Mordor. We didn't know about Mordor then. <laughs> okay. And we thought that was terrific. We didn't know any better. But now we know so much more, I think. <laughs> okay. Uh, so thank you for being here. Uh, I think we'll go into our next piece of the program where uh, there may be some Q&A uh, for people who have spoken. And then after that, we have some testimony or some comments. Testimony sounds too rigid. Uh, that's, we want to hear what people have on their minds, especially when it comes to uh, being harmed. You want me to go through our list of tasks? Oh, oh okay. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Angelo is my uh, other part of my brain. <laughs> I'm glad we have him. Uh, and we want to just go through our ask again. It feels like rubber bullets bouncing off uh, a Sherman tank, but we keep on trying. So, uh, so Angelo's going to recite our litany of ask one more time. Uh, at this time, ACAN had, uh, has basically two categories of asks. One that we spoke about before in terms of reopening uh, the 2012 and 2014 consent agreements, uh, consent decrees, and uh, that relates to the petitions that, the, uh, the blue petitions on your, on your chairs. Uh, now, now, I know, uh, Jamie, you mentioned that um, you have a different approach to that, and I'm sure we'll, we'll be having discussions. Um, our, our second category of asks were things that really we really wanted um, uh, EPA and the health department to do immediately, things that we felt should be done immediately to uh, address the pollution issues. And, and the first one is, is to immediately increase monitoring, uh, that, that is, the monitoring that the health department inspectors do um, at the San Angle site. Um, and, the, and that this monitoring should include afternoon, night, and weekend inspections. Right now, the, the inspections are only during the daylight shift. And um, if you do the calculations, uh, uh, based on the calculations that we did, uh, we think that uh, the health department inspectors are only on site about 12% of the time. So when they say that there were a certain number of violations, um, it's really violations only during the time when they're doing the inspections. It doesn't take into account 
all that, that the other time, the other uh, almost 90% of the time. The, the second ask is to um, hire a consultant to recommend pollution prevention improvements at the plant. Um, we, uh, based on what we've seen, uh, we believe that Shenango is not proactive concerning pollution prevention. Uh, the third, third ask is to require Shenango to curtail operations on bad air days. And our thinking there is that the, the, the government asks us to uh, curtail our activities, our driving, our lawn mowing, et cetera, on, on bad air days. Uh, and yet, uh, Shenango isn't asked to do, to do the same thing. The, the fourth ask uh, relates to what um, uh, Randy Sargent uh, from CMU indicated in his presentation, and, and that is that um, if there were cameras on site, uh, on the Chenango site, um, we would better be able to identify where emissions were coming from, um, and that information would be very useful for uh, enforcement and repair. So we're, we're asking for the installation of on-site cameras. Uh, the fifth, fifth ask uh, is that the plant cannot operate with all, without all pollution controls functioning. Um, but we know for a fact that Chenango is allowed to release toxic hydrogen sulfide for up to two weeks while uh, that a pollution control unit is shut down for maintenance. Um, that, that just is not acceptable. Um, the, the sixth ask is for the regulation of all emissions on the site. Um, current regulations don't address some sources of, of emission, uh, and we feel that um, that's, uh, that needs to be addressed because there are a lot of sources there uh, that are putting off emissions and they're just not looked at uh, based on current regulations. Um, the last uh, ask is that there be timely publication of DTE Shenango violations on the ACA, on the health department's website. Uh, these are presently not put on the website at all. Those, those are our, those, those are our seven, a ask, uh, seven asks that we feel sh uh, can be uh, uh, done and worked on immediately. Thank you. Okay, now we get to have some interaction. So uh, we had some cards passed out for Q&A. So do we have those cards? Okay. Uh, I have a question about the procedure here. Um, these uh, demands are demands of um, the people that are here, like uh, the health department. And I'm wondering whether they could be asked to respond uh, to wh what they, how they're going to respond to each of these that you're yeah. uh, What do you think about the department you did? Yeah. Well, we don't need to put you on the slide too much, right? Well, I'm not sure I can respond to all of them, but there's some there's some things that I can speak to. Um, we uh, our, ah, our third Coke oven inspection inspector, uh, Beryl Denny, retired this past April uh, or May, uh, and so we've been down to two Coke plant inspectors. Now I realize that you know we have we have two inspectors for everything else, and we have two for Coke plants. Um, I am happy to say that we have recently hired a third one back again. Um, and, and she's right in, now doing her final training and when she uh, gets fully trained then she will be able to, she has serious experience at coke plants so it's not that kind of training, she, it's just a matter of the procedures and, and the regulations that she'll be inspecting. Um, so we're very pleased that we'll be able to 
increase inspection. Um, there are some limitations to nighttime inspections as those that have done smoke reading know that there's only so many things you can look at because you can't read smoke in, in a legal term um, during the nighttime. But there are some things that we can do and we are looking at that. Also, um, as, as also is, is good news, is that we've been pushing and finally um, we are going to have a second lawyer, attorney, that is dedicated to air quality activity. Um, he's not here yet, but he's weeks away. So by the end of the year, we'll have a second attorney to help us with enforcement activities. And so that's, that's going to help us greatly with Shenango as well as Claret and Coke Works and, and all the other things we've got going on. Um, we've got a number of asbestos issues going on. So having an, a second man to, to, or in this case, man to, uh, to assist us is, is going to help us a great deal. So, I mean, not all of these. Um, we've talked about the on-site on camera. We're not sure. I mean, that's just something Randy's been looking at is to see whether or not it was viable. Uh, we have to, because he picked a, a, a stack. It's a question of whether it can be done. We just don't know what can and can't be done. And if it can be done, will it still be able to be used as an enforcement tool? There's a whole process to use a camera as an enforcement tool, so we have to go through that. But we are looking at it, and we're looking at that, sir. So um, uh, I, can't, I can't, you know, talk about all of them, but I can speak to those, I guess, uh, right now. Um, our website, we're always trying to improve our website. We're always a bit behind. As a county, we have one webmaster for the entire health department. We have been looking at how to put both complaints and violations because that's been repeatedly requested as, as some sort of an information. Uh, how do we put them up there in a way that makes sense? So that sort of thing. So. I guess those, those are the ones I can respond to immediately. The rest of them I need to take back and take the staff and work through. Uh, while you're still up there, uh, the, Mr. Cranville has a question. Uh, is your extra inspector going to get us back to 12% or will it take us to 18 inspection? Well, I'm not sure where the 12% comes from. We have, we are, we are, we have like I said, we have, I said earlier, we have an inspector that goes out there every work day. We also have a contractor that goes out there every day. There, there's, uh, I'm not sure, 12, 12 percent, I think it's so what is What is the percentage? I would have to, I'm not sure. And like I said, and like I said, and like I said, there's very little inspection you can actually do at night. It's limited. We can put inspectors out there. Well, I have to close my windows when I go to sleep because of that plan. So yeah. Me you too. Know, maybe you should think about inspecting. Uh, and, and yeah. uh, uh, isn't there a rule or a capability that lighting is possible uh, to put in light, uh, some sort of light arrangements? I'd have to read the rules on smoke readers. I, I don't okay. have to see how that is. Uh, yeah, Sue Seppi, so. sir, from gas, she knows more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's a possibility. We, that's can a possibility. Get, we can look into that. We can look into that. Okay. okay. Um, any other? Q&A in general? I have one. Um, it seems like if you were home tonight, there was a fire in your house, you would call the fire department and put out the fire. This thing's been going on long before I ever cleaned out of it. 100% of those violations all the way across the board. Don't you have any power to stop it? Yeah. 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 Nothing, the Health has nothing, the EPA has no say. Um, fines aren't going to do anything. It's just a payoff for everybody on board. And it just goes on year after year after year. And why can't the fire be put out? Okay. That would be a very long question, long answer to go to a question. There, there are federal rules that a battery has to abide by. They actually meet all the federal rules. That meets all the federal that rules. That meets all the federal rules. The county, the county rules are significantly tighter than the federal rules. When, when EPA was in the process of writing the federal rules, um, the, I was very young then, but we sent down our head enforcement person actually a person from GASP uh, and a number of other people from this area and around the country they said we cannot abide by the rules that Allegheny County requires of the battery of the plants 
And so the, the Coke plants actually are in compliance with federal rules. They're not entirely in compliance with our rules. They, they have, uh, there are exceptions and there are violations and that's what we're working on and we're continuing to work on with, with, our, with our guys. That's what I'm saying. I don't know that they are violating the consent orders. That's what I want to fine tooth because because on the surface they are complying with the federal with the consent order. Did you sign it in the consent decree? They were in violation. No, the, well the consent the federal consent order was for the stack emissions. And they are in compliance with the federal consent order for the stack emissions. Most most of the state most of the federal rules are 30-day rolling averages, so your emissions are based on what happened over 30 days. We don't like that. We don't. We don't. As a county, we do not. Um, well, I think step up a little bit. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania needs to step up to, to deal with this because this can't be. Uh, I don't think on the federal. We might as well move to China. Yeah. <laughs> really, I think about it. There's, there's no regulation here. I can tell you what some of that smoke is. Some of it's unburnt diesel fuel. Some of it's soot. I know it. It goes on my porch every month. And come a month later, I clean my porch. It's like I have a crush in here. year. At 2 o'clock in the morning, there's a roar. If I go off and go to the bathroom, the whole window shape is a roar for 15 yes. minutes. What the hell is they doing over there? It sounds like a jet engine. Uh, they're running something at night. Your inspection should be at night as well as the day. They need a more. Why don't we take a short comment from here? Okay. 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 Um, I, I think we're, we've just segued into comments. <laughs> Uh, uh, and we can make our, we can uh, state how we're feeling, and maybe you've already registered for comments, I don't know. Uh, but the requirement for comments is you need to be a resident of their communities, and if you're a worker and a resident, that's great. We'd love to have you say a few words. Um, uh, if you think you've been impacted by the air, and by the way, if you live in Pittsburgh, the East End even, you've probably been impacted both by our coke works and the other coke works amongst other things okay um, so with that thought in mind um, so we'll have some comments and if anyone from the epa or acd feels to comment there's you know, wants to they're welcome to uh, but i think more of now we're, we're going to express our ire and maybe our frustration how's that sound <laughs> okay <laughs> so uh so for, first on the list I have from Ben Ave and Ray Winter. Would you come up? And if you can be so kind as to be dense with your comments, <laughs> meaning maybe two to three minutes. I think Father John said, you used to teach uh, at Duquesne University, right? And he's, and I, it was a wonderful explanation. He says, I will only take two to three minutes. I taught my students how to do a sermon in two to three minutes. <laughs> Boy, I'd like to be at one of those sermons. <laughs> so we can take a lead from Father John, maybe, okay? Yes, I'm 65 years old, and I have lived in this area for 65 years. To the people of Avalon, when I was a child growing up, Every morning, we had black soot and silver soot inside our windowsills. If you wanted to use the patio furniture, mom had to clean it every day. If you were outside playing in the summertime, you had to come in because the smell was so bad, mom was afraid for our lives. It's 2015. I'm still cleaning the soot yes. off my furniture outside. I don't like to sit outside. I work outside. I have to come in. Year's 2015. That was, gee, 50 years ago I was going through the same nonsense. At night you want to sleep. And all of a sudden you wake up with a burning sensation in your throat. You wake up with a burning sensation in your nose. And you start hacking and coughing. And you have to close your windows in all that heat. You cannot enjoy it. Thank you. So 
so Ray, uh, just to, he, you now currently live in Ben Avon? Yes. Correct? 48 years. 48 years in Ben Avon. He, he moved out of Avalon, but not far enough away, I guess. <laughs> I'm sorry? Emsworth. Emsworth? Yeah. Okay. So if you're familiar with how this, uh, the prevailing winds work from across uh, Shenango, they're generally from the south, southwest. And there, the ground zero is Avalon, where the monitor is. Thank you for placing it there. Uh, and then it fans out from there. So Emsworth is on one edge. Brighton Heights is on another edge. And on, a, on particularly strange days, it'll go anywhere, okay, including down to a Steeler game. Um, okay, so next is Lewis Bram of uh, Bellevue. You, uh, you're down here. You want to say some more? Um, no, I, 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 well, one thing I wanted to ask is you say like about violations that are, you know, they're not in violation, but when they are in violation of climate, but how do you give the fines any teeth if they're only like 500 at all? I mean, are you going to give them, change the violation with you so if they're a higher level of, you know, actually give it to the violations and the regulations of some teeth? It actually means something, because right now it's just the cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. They do not care. It means nothing. So I, I just want that question. Okay. And, and maybe I can segue into that. My understanding, you tell me if I'm wrong, uh, that when you have a consent decree placed, you put a cap on the violations? In the consent decree itself, for that action, there is a set amount of money. There's a set amount of money. For any other regulation, it goes in our regular enforcement. Okay. So, but uh, we'll talk about the consent decree violations that have been covered. So what that suggests is, if I got it right, that if that violation occurs again, it's still the same amount of money. Depends on the consent decree. Depends on consent decree. So, in other words, if you or I get a traffic ticket, uh, it's like say you you've got an agreement with the cop, <laughs> you might say, uh, that if I if you find me guilty again of a traffic violation, you won't give me any stricter fine than what I had before. Is that a good analogy? Depends Not a, on the consent decree. It depends on maybe it depends on the cop in this case. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's how I read that. So some of them happen that way. Okay, and some of them don't. Okay, um, how about how about Janet Strahovski of Avalon? Would you please come up? Um, so we no, uh, we we can't hear you. We can't hear you from here. You're, you're not bashful. Come on, <laughs> I've heard you no, speak I've before. Been known to <laughs> uh, I'll stand behind you. <laughs> This has been a lovely show. I appreciate it. I have heard it before. We have all heard it before. We have proof now to our complaints that have been going on for as long as I can remember. I want to know how many consent decrees do they need before something can be done about shutting Shenango? Yes. They are a bad neighbor. They have been a bad neighbor, and I don't expect it to get any better. There's a balance of power, profits versus losses. Their profits versus our health losses. There is nothing they can do to make things better for us other than going out of business. So my new mantra is get them out of there. That's all I have to say. Uh, next, we have Scott Bressler from Avalon. Basically, just saying, I mean, everyone said everything I had to say at this point. It's a property value issue, obviously, a health issue. Come on, come on up, come on up. And just things like the soot that's coming underneath our, our um, baseboards. Uh, you can see around the edges of the rooms, the carpeting. Uh, the furniture. Okay, everyone's covered everything that I had to say. I just wanted to make sure. Okay, well, we, we appreciate you being here, but you're, I think you would be so much better up here, though. <laughs> don't be, don't, please don't be shy. Um, okay, so an, another, uh, some more anecdotal evidence that things aren't right, even though the monitors may say something else or the violations seem to be in order, but the citizenry is saying, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, okay, let me go to Matt Rind of Bellevue. Matt? Oh, you're so, you're so, 
You're so vocal when we're together, though. <laughs> But we, we can't, the, the, the mic, the... Uh, I think the previous comments I have just say in that too. Okay, all right. Next. Uh, Melanie Holcomb. She's not shy. <laughs> and Mel Melanie's in Ben Avid. Hi, uh, my name is Melanie Holcomb. I'm a Ben Avid resident for 15 years. Uh, I've lived and worked and owned small business in town. Um, I used to be very proud of this neighborhood. I worked here before I moved here. Uh, I loved it. Um, I'm not proud of it anymore. When I was in my business, it was a coffee shop down the street and we would, people would come in when they were shopping for homes and say, tell me about the neighborhood. Do you like it? Oh, it's perfect. Great schools, wonderful neighbors, beautiful stuff. I quit saying that after a few years. And I'm not saying that anymore, I'm saying the opposite. Um, friends of mine are moving, not out of Pittsburgh, but out of this area. They're staying in the Avonmore School District because they like it, but they're getting out of this zone because they have children and they want them to grow up in a slightly healthier environment. Um, I'm tired of being on the worst list. I'm tired of being the worst polluters. I'm tired of being on the highest cancer risks. I'm tired of neighbors fighting on Facebook and the next door sites about, quit talking about this, it's bringing attention, you're gonna lower our property values. We want to improve our neighborhood. We want to raise the standard of our living. We want to make our property values better because you don't look out your beautiful windows and see that and smell that. Um, I didn't grow up here in Pittsburgh, so I can't say, as some people have said to me, it's so much better than it used to be. Um, there's a lot of things that used to be that aren't anymore. Polio, uh, <laughs> drunk driving. Um, they, because a bunch of moms got mad and got together and laws changed. And moms are getting mad. Um, you know. <laughs> Some other things that used to not be. A lot of my neighbors used to not have cancer. When you look at any of those cancer maps, we are smack in it. Uh, benzene is everywhere on all of the emissions that we've talked about. They're on the American Cancer Society website, it's listed as a big carcinogen. There is no safe level of benzene, and we're living in it. Ben Avon itself, this neighborhood, is a top earner for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society every year. They have a light up the night fundraiser, and we raise a crap ton of money because we know people in this neighborhood, down the block, three blocks that way, two blocks that way, that have leukemia, and these are parents of children in this neighborhood. Um, it's a backhanded thing to be proud of, that we're the top earner. Uh, it's very personal to us, and we don't know who to go to anymore. I was here last year. I've been to a lot of meetings. I got frustrated, as everybody is here. Um, there's people in, the, in Detroit they're getting rich off of our decline. Uh, last year, we talked about these same things. We went to protests, we signed petitions all year. I went to DC and I talked to Mr. Doyle and Mr. Casey about it. Um, I've been to the city county building. I don't wanna be standing here again next year talking about the same things to the same people with the same lack of result. My last thought is that I know that the politics of this are hard, and I know that the webs and the strings that you have to crawl through to get anything done is difficult. But there's a lot of things that we're living with that are difficult. It's difficult for the school nurse to keep track of all the inhalers in her school. It's difficult for us to drive our neighbors to chemo. It's difficult to have chemo. It's difficult to have heart surgery. And it's really, really difficult to go to the funerals of mothers who've left four children behind. And the two people who I know 
most in this neighborhood who came down with this disease were runners. And what do you do when you run? You go out into the neighborhood and you breathe every day this air, more than I do, because I stay in. <laughs> and they were braver than I am. And they still are, because they're going through leukemia. So I know that that sounds hyperbolic, and I don't mean it to be that way, but it's the flippin' fact. I look at this little brown paper map here that one of our artists drew for the church, and I just want to put labels on every house. Breast cancer, leukemia, you know, both, both husband and wife breast cancer in this house. It's just a map of the failure of us to protect ourselves. And we don't have anyone else to do that but you. So please do that. Uh, thank you, Melanie. Thank you for being so eloquent. Um, we have uh, Benjamin Salbach Welsh from the Keys Rocks. Hello, everyone. I don't think many people get my name right on the first try, so thank you. I very much appreciate that. That was, that was spot on. Uh, I grew up in the uh, wilds of PA. Uh, my family was very blessed to have a spring and have our own source of water and be self-sufficient in that way. And, um, you know, fracking, of course, has been a major source of concern for us. So I've, been, I've been conscious of environmental issues for a, quite a while. I moved into the city for school uh, in 2004. It's been 11 years. And um, of all the places, I've lived around even Oakland with all of its gridlock. When I moved to McKee's Rocks in uh, August, uh, I don't think the pollution has been as bad anywhere else in the city that I have lived. Um, uh, my, it's to the point that my family is wondering whether some of the health issues I've been experiencing um, since I moved there um, uh, are a result of the air quality and the air quality issues. It's to the point that um, when the wind's blowing just right, like my parents are encouraging me, don't open your windows, don't uh, leave them closed. And I love clean air. It's such an important thing to me. I, I do a lot of deep breathing. I, 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 it's very important uh, as much as any other source of life. Uh, it's a basic need and a basic necessity. Um, I want to read you a comment from my father if I can find it. Uh, my father is not a man um, who has a particularly uh, keen sense of smell. Um, uh, but uh, just the other day, I had the window open, and he, uh, he passed by it, and he was coming to visit. And he made the comment that he used to work at an oil refinery. But the smell he got from that open window uh, in my bathroom was as bad as anything he smelled uh, walking next to the tanks. Um, I'm relatively new to this. I mean, I just moved here. Um, I, I've got a beautiful little house up on a hill uh, looking down in Pittsburgh. I'd love to stay. Um, but this is a serious concern, even as far away uh, as McKee's Rocks. So thank you for all your work, uh, everyone, and keep it up. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Nick Stokes or Stokes from Pittsburgh, and by the way, Pittsburgh covers a big area for yeah. uh, an address area. If you live in Ben Avon, you have a Pittsburgh address one five two zero two. So we get to co-join with the city that way. Go ahead. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Nick Stokes, and I work with an organization called Rising Tide, um, and I appreciate all of the testimony that I've heard today, and I just want to extend Rising Tide's support to the work that uh, you all are doing and everything that you all are going through, and say that we stand behind you in the fight against Shenango and the stuff that's happening. Um, the only piece that I sort of wanted to add to this, and it's, you know, I appreciate all of the technical data that folks are offering, but it also strikes me that this is a political issue as well. 
Um, and it's a political issue in the sense that the, it, and it's, it's a David and Goliath issue, right? Because a, lo a lot of it is, is us as community members up against uh, really giant corporations with extensive resources and extensive money to be able to influence how regulations and things get passed. And on the air quality subcommittee, half of the members of that subcommittee represent industry interests in some way, right? Or if they don't represent industry interests directly, they are tied to industry in interests because they facilitate or defend in a court of law industry interests. And I think that that is one of the most kind of critical aspects of things that we need to look at uh, in this. And we're not gonna get justice in Shenango and a lot of other places that are going through similar things that you all are going through unless we take on that piece also and start calling some attention to those entities and the influence that they have over the way that regulations get moved and the teeth behind those regulations, right? So that's all I wanted to say, thank you. And our next speaker is Mark Dixon, and he's a pretty shy person. He, oh, by the way, he's uh, taking a, a video of our whole session this evening. If any of you have a problem with having the back of your head on the video <laughs> or uh, uh, speaking in front of a camera, please see Mark. Okay. Thank you. All right, I live in Highland Park. Um, and uh, I've submitted at least 20 complaints to the ACHD in this 2015 year. Every time I step outside and it stinks, I email them. I come, because I usually go jogging, I'm one of those joggers, and I'm not looking forward to my cancer. Um, but uh, I don't have cancer right now, as far as I know, but I don't want it. And so I turn around and go inside every time I smell the air. And I complain to the ACHD, and they always tell me it's an inversion, and there's nothing we could do. We're working on it. And so 20 times later, I also asked for a report of all the complaints into the ACHD since the start of 2015. And there were over 2,000 complaints about all sorts of things, not just air quality, like not just this. But I did a Google, a little, did a little search in that list for Shenango, and it came up 600 times. Some of those are double entries, so I suspect at least 300 approximate complaints about Shenango were submitted to the ACHD just this year. I have some, some written remarks, I'm going to read them now. I call on you tonight to listen and then act. And do not disregard us as calling out from the fringe of public opinion. We are calling out from the very center of your moral soul. We are calling out from the past, the present, and the future. For you, in this critical moment, to heed the warnings given voice tonight and act while there is still time to proceed with a shred of your moral dignity intact. We call out today from the center of common sense and decency in a city where our lungs burn with the foul stench of coking gases and coal emissions released into a weather system prone to temperature inversions. Are we crazy to think that we have a right to clean air as mentioned in the state constitution? Are we unjustified in our outrage over Pittsburgh's woeful spot near the top of the worst polluted urban areas in the country? Are we wild-eyed when we highlight how Article 21 of the Allegheny County Health Department's rules and regulations states that no person shall operate or allow to be operated any source in such manner that emissions of malodorous matter from such source are perceptible beyond the property line of such source? We call out from the future to remind you that the sources of the foul emissions assaulting our lungs are not just violations of our constitution and local laws. They are an insult to future generations who are looking to us to immediately and dramatically cut our carbon emissions. Do you know that at the upcoming COP21 climate negotiations in Paris, our government officials will be working hard to find a path to keep our global temperature below 2C above pre-industrial levels? Do you know that they're working towards plans that primarily give us only a 66% chance of achieving that goal? 
that all IPCC plans um, keeping us below 2C involve a massive CO2 removal from the atmosphere. Do you know that the fringe United Nations estimates that global commitments to date bring us to 2.7 C? Do you know that if we want a 90% chance of staying below 2 C, then we need to stop all carbon emissions today? Yes. Do you know that one of our country's leading climate scientists, James Hansen, calls the 2 C target catastrophic and advocates for a target of 1 C? Why then are any carbon emissions legal in this day and age? Least of all, the horribly toxic and smelly ones like we have around here. Is there any justification for government inaction on this front? And finally, we call out from the past to ask you that you not waste this precious democracy for which so many have bravely worked, fought, and died for on the spurious notion that it will all turn out okay no matter what you fail to do. Climate change is a problem whose solution has a time limit. And we must honor our past by proving to the future that our governmental structure, our dear democracy, has the capacity to meaningfully address the climate crisis, or that government may well be sacrificed to the global unrest caused by climate change itself. If you fear the thought of disrupting the status quo, just wait and see what your own inaction will do. If you fear the thought of jeopardizing your own career prospects, just imagine what your own conscience will do to you late at night when you consider the meaning of your life during this most critical time in human history. The burning lungs of Pittsburgh residents are the canaries in the coal mine when it comes to climate change. Will you heed our rational pleas to address the foul-smelling insults of our day? Or will you let us suffer while the world burns, and with it, your moral dignity? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for connecting the canary in the coal mine, or the litmus test that we have right here. So we have local issues to deal with that contribute to climate change. Uh, and last on our my card is Leo Kelly of Moon. Is Leo here? I don't want to on your list, but I would like to speak other than Ensworth or one Ensworth Council. Please come up. We didn't recognize you. <laughs> You're shy, are you? <laughs> Sometimes I am. So, okay, so please state your name and you, you live in Emsworth. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm Daniel Lenz. I'm on Emsworth Council. Uh, next month will be my second year. I'm on a four year term. I just finished MS4 compliancy training last month. And one of the unique subjects of this was is how DEP is going to come into your borough. And if you are not in compliant, we're going to just find the hell out of you. And there is a borough that was fined $140,000 because they didn't do their compliancy according to DEP in Allegheny County. So, it, I mean, come on now. They're over there killing people. But, you know, the federal government, let me tell you about the federal government. I think they stink. And the reason for that is, I watch a lot of air disaster shows. Not that I want to see people die. I want to see what brought the airliner down. And one of the sad parts of, her, of NTSB investigating, they have no teeth. They make recommendations to FAA, who puts out the rules and regulations. And they've had numerous second crashes because FAA did not act and more people die. It's called tombstone technology. And until the federal government puts more bite in what they're doing over there, nothing's going to change. More people are going to get sick, more people are going to die. You have to change it from the top and make them accountable. 
And these little piddly fines that you're levying against them are nothing. And you're gonna find a little borough, $140,000, and almost bankrupt them? Thank you. Uh, I think Roger Cranville, where did he go? Yeah, he would like to say a few words and then you next, okay? Uh, Roger lives in Kilbach Township. Uh, so we have a lineup of boroughs along the river and behind it we have townships, okay? Thank you, Ted. Thank you for your noble efforts. Um, I have four questions and a request. First questions, first of the four questions, how many violations is it going to take? I think we deserve an answer to, to that. Second question, why is the EPA here tonight? Are you listening to what you're hearing? I see one nod. I got to two. I got three. That was a bit sort of tacit. And to follow up on that, can you come back next year? Number three. How can Chester Babst represent Shenango and be objective on Fitzgerald's Committee for Air Quality. Yeah. And now the request. Can you all get your calendars out? Because we'll be back here next year, I suspect. Thank you very much. Uh, there was another person. Come on up. I'll just stand here. I can talk uh, My name is Kate. I, I am from the Rocks also. The Keys Rocks. The Keys Rocks. The Rocks. The Rocks. The rocks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, it's more of a comment. I walk a lot and, and walk across the Keys Rocks Bridge, and I notice the fire from Shenango. I have, I have no idea. I'm not originally from this side of town. I'm from Green Tree, Crappy Green Tree. Area and uh, but I asked people about the fire and they said, Oh, yeah, that's Sun Island. Uh, it was like surreal to me that nobody knew anything, of, or they don't know, but nobody talked about it or thought about it or were so used to it or something. And I just would look at it. My grandson was here visiting me this summer and he took pictures from down, down the railroad tracks. Because um, you can see it. <laughs> and, and she's talking about the flare. The flare, fire, fire okay. that, that thing right there. <laughs> and, I mean, it was just like amazing to me. And then people say Shenango, and I think West Virginia. I mean, <laughs> I'm so glad to be here. And the only way I found out about this particular thing was at the movie on um, last Friday evening. Right. So I'm glad to know we'll go to my council and present this because I feel like something we need to gather as a group, but to be pessimistic, I'm like really wondering if anything can ever be done about any of this. I feel like I play whack-a-mole all my life. And just as something seems to get done, and I don't want to get brutalized like the people in the film, not that I wouldn't take a frontline position, but it's like over and over and over again. This does go on, and what Mark said is this is the past. People talk they lived here in the past. Sure, so now, I don't have that. My windows are open right now at home, and I leave them open. I'll, I'll feel great right my heart to close it tonight. But I guess I'm going on. What I really wanted to say was I've been looking at that fire and wondering. I knew it could be good. <laughs> Uh, where's, where's our, our operator here? Uh, a segue to the movie that we all saw. Um, this Changes Everything by Naomi Klein. Um, 
So you have handouts at your seats. Uh, we're getting another special showing. We're co-sponsoring it with the Parkway Theater on the 30th at 7.30, so please be there. Um, they talk a lot about people being on the front lines. We're on the front lines here. We're on the front lines here. But we're not making as big a fuss as they are, are we? But we could. We could. Not yet. So uh, that being said, um, I think we're finished for this evening, unless uh, our guests from the EPA or ACHD would like to make any closing comments, or I could close. Everybody looks weary. <laughs> it's a long drive from Philadelphia. <laughs> okay, they made it in today. Uh, yes, Frank. Let me address the EPA. Okay. Uh, Frank uh, is the, the husband of, can I introduce you that yes. way? <laughs> Karen Gershwinski, who has been a long time uh, advocate of cleaner air. She's been a fellow smoke reader or emissions evaluator. We've hung out too many times uh, watching Shenango from behind the uh, Metro Motors. And I think she's paying the price right now. She has extreme asthma conditions and she, neither she or I don't go there anymore. Okay. I am a former criminal prosecutor with the Attorney General's office. And I was on a joint task force at one time used to have a criminal investigator with the EPA with an FBI agent, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I was specially sworn as a U.S. Attorney. I know that not only do you have the right to open the consent agreement, you have the right to investigate Shenango criminally and civilly. I would ask EPA to take these films back to Washington, D.C. and Region 3 and do an investigation. I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. I didn't ask. <laughs> I didn't ask. You don't know what you don't know. Okay. Um, so, um, it's approaching 8.30. Uh, our, technically, we said we'd be here for about two hours. We went over that a bit, uh, and thank, thank you for most of you staying. I really appreciate it. So it's uh, good to see the turnout, and thank you very much for our guests for being here. Uh, I hope we didn't rub you too, the wrong way too much. <laughs> uh, <laughs>